to interview former F1 star Gianni Morbidelli and find out how Corvette take technology from track to road. Mobile One The Grid gets underway in the USA with a look at the tech transfer from the circuits to the streets with Corvette Racing. Other than the racing livery, there's very little difference to the naked eye between Tommy Milner and Oliver Gavin's C7R race car and GM's flagship Corvette and Z06. Cut from the same carbon fibre cloth, the technology transfer from track to road has never been so evident. I think one of the most amazing things about the Z06 C7 is the closest car that Corvette have ever produced to a race car on the road. You know, there's been so much tech transfer from Corvette Racing to the production car side of things. The relationship between design, Corvette engineering, and the race team, that whole circle of knowledge is something special. There's no other manufacturer in the world a, a mass-produced vehicle that has a technology transfer that we do at Corvette. We take what we learn at the racetrack and we're building you a race car that you can buy at your dealer. Engineered to mirror the race car and performance, the Z06 is as powerful as its racing counterpart. With a supercharged 6.2 litre V8 engine delivering 650 horsepower, the industry's only street with supercar to achieve such a feat. The blending of street car to race car on that on this new Z06 is incredible, and, and it's a downforce that really starts blurring the lines because now you can roll through turn 12 at Bertalana with huge speed, 120 miles an hour, which when you're driving a street car, you don't expect that. It's amazing what that technology that we learn on the racetrack gets applied to that street car. In the GT class, we're racing against the same competitors we're competing with the showroom. We use the same lightweight aluminum frame structure. We have a forward tilt radiator system that exhausts the hot air through the hood. That's also right from racing. We have the ducts and the quarter panels. One cools the transmission, the other cools the differential. And one of the things that's really exciting, we have what we call a performance data recorder. It can now record video, audio, and data of your epic drives, and you can review them just like you're your own race engineer. We talked a lot about the aerodynamics, the flow of air over the body, and actually through the body. All the air intakes and air exits that you see on the car, they're for real. They really help with the engine cooling and with the downforce on the car. Dialogue between the production and the race team is constant, relaying valuable track data to ensure future development for the Z06. There is not literally a day goes by that someone on this race team isn't talking to someone on the production team. We are deeply embedded in that program. We have a very strong relationship. It's real time, and obviously the results are, are pretty clear when you go look at the production car. People like Doug Behan, Tommy Milner have been a big part of developing this car, even to the point where we're developing the play of the car. When we look at tech transfer, it's more than just simply building a better road car. What it does is it increases the value of what we do on the racetrack. And I think that says a lot for building a strong foundation for sports car racing, certainly in North America. Eight-time winners at the 24 Hours of Le Mans, Corvette's dominance around the world throughout the years has influenced the design of the current C7R and CN6, pushing performance from track to road, giving the fans an opportunity to get behind the wheel of their favorite race car. The fans who love the race car, when they buy the production car, they feel as though they've got a bit of the car that ran at Le Mans. I just think that that's just so cool that the guys from Corvette Racing have been able to transfer some of that technology onto the, all the guys there on the production side to produce this wonderful beast of a car and the Z06 C7. I, I, I just think it's, it's great for all the customers to actually experience some of the stuff that we're experiencing on the racetrack. We wrap up the IndyCar season now with a visit to Sonoma, California, where the 2015 championship was hanging in the balance. 
There had been nine different winners from the first 15 races this season, but Juan Pablo Montoya had led the title race all year. Highlight, second victory at the big one. The winner of the Indianapolis 500 is Juan Pablo Montoya. Just 34 points behind, Graham Rahal ended a 125 race winless drought at Montana before surging into title contention with victory in mid Ohio. But this was no two horse race. With double points on offer, defending champ Will Power, Elio Castaneves, and three time champion Scott Dixon were all still in the hunt. Before the title was decided, though, the grid took time to remember British driver Justin Wilson, who lost his life at Pokemon. the late Justin Wilson, it's the Indy Grand Prix of Sonoma, it's the championship decider, it's time to bring the action! Will Power, look at Hunter Ray on the inside of Newgarden, he goes for it, Ray Hall sweeps around the outside, they climb the hill! Montoya makes it through clean, that is huge for his championship hopes! Montoya up to fourth, Ray and Ray Hall and Scott Dixon were banging wheels as they tried to keep the championship leader in sight. But Team Penske weren't doing themselves any favours. Don't tell me the teammates collide. Surely not. Oh, no. they do. What did I tell you? Oh, it looked boy. like he had damage to that bumper and got tagged and spun around. With Will Power out of the running, Dixon moved into the lead, leaving Montoya playing catch-up after stopping for a new front wing. Sebastian Bourdais was in a obliging mood and spanned Graham Rahal out of contention with nine to go. Montoya was up to six, level on points with Dixon, but the Kiwi was in position to take the title, having won more races. Penske Man needed one more place. Can you believe, after 16 races, this championship will be decided this way? One more lap left. For Scott Dixon, do you think there's a pretty good reason why he's Ganassi's longest tenured driver? 14 years driving for Chip. There goes Canaan, there goes Briscoe, Montoya, closer. oh, it's going to be close, close, closing in, getting even closer, so it's going to be the last corner where this happens. Dixon gets back-to-back -back wins at Sonoma, but we can't give this championship to him just yet. We wait for the rest to come across the line, and Montoya cannot do it. Scott Dixon not only wins in Sonoma, but wins the 2015 championship. I still can't believe it. I still, it was such a long shot to get this through, and, and, and I guess we won it on comeback too for, for sure. most wins uh, we tied with, with JPM. So uh, sorry to them, but uh, fantastic for the team. We head to Sochi in Russia now to meet a motor racing veteran with eyes on a new touring car title. Gianni Morbidelli started 67 Formula One races with Scuderia Italia, Minardi, Ferrari, Footwork and Sauber. The highlight, a podium finish in Australia in 1995. At 47, the Italian is now one of Touring Car's biggest stars and in the midst of his latest campaign, the TCR International Series. TCR is a, a Touring Car Championship where the cars are uh, very equal, uh, the performance between all the cars, even if uh, different brands, uh, are very similar. So this uh, gives uh, the possibility to offer a good show, a good uh, balanced performance uh, during the race. In British, Italian, European and World Touring Car Championships, the Fasaro native has seen his fair share of intense rivalries. TCR has attracted a whole new generation of ambitious young talent. In a category like a TCR, we have uh, different drivers, uh, drivers with a longer experience like me or some very young drivers. You must be careful about everyone, you know, uh, even if they are only 18 years old or if uh, they are 50 years old, it doesn't matter, you know. Now you can uh, be involved in the motorsport uh, since a very young uh, age, so this uh, means that uh, when uh, you are in a category like this and even if you are only 18 or 19 years old, you have uh, enough experience to compete with the people with more experience than you. Contact are the part of the, the, this championship, are part of the, all the touring car championship, but of course there is a limit for everything. You can try to overtake in some places where normally with the formula you cannot, for example, but in the meantime, you know, you must finish your race, you cannot damage your, your car, you cannot damage the car of the other the driver. If you have to think about the championship, you must score points in every single event. 
I try to do my best, you know. You never finish uh, to have exam in your life. Life is, uh, is full of exam, you know. Even if I have uh, 47 years old and uh, I made every single category from karting to Formula One, I never finish it to show how I'm good. So if you work well today, maybe you have a possibility to carry on tomorrow. A flying start to the campaign with victories in China and his home round at Monza saw Morbidelli leading the title race while slipping to fourth in his last two outings. But with nearly 30 years' experience and a great team behind him, the charismatic Italian may yet add the TCR title to his impressive CV. The West Coast Racing is a very nice team, very professional. I feel like to be in a, in a big family here. They like me, they, I like them, we have a good relationship between us and uh, we are working all together for the same objective. We have to, you know, to thinking about all the time to do our best and of course, if in the end of the championship we will be in front of everyone, we will be more satisfied for sure. After the break, we get set for NASCAR's chase for the Sprint Cup and catch up with gamer turned racer Jan Mardenborough. Welcome back to Mobile One The Grid. With NASCAR's playoffs fast approaching, we catch up with current champion Stuart Haas Racing. In 2004, NASCAR radically changed its competition finale, and 11 seasons later, the divisive chase format seems here to stay. Going into this year's final round, SHR can boast three chase champions in Kurt Busch, Tony Stewart, and Kevin Harvick. Three-time NASCAR champion Stewart is still fighting for a regular season win in 2015, but as co-owner of the Stewart Haas Racing Stable, his focus is not solely on his own number 14 car. When you're a driver, you're thinking of one car. When you're a team owner, you have to think of all four cars. And especially when you get to that point and, and you start the chase and you realize that one of the cars doesn't have a, a chance at all at racing for the championship, but one of your teams does. Kevin Harvick and the number 14 burst out of the gates this year with two wins and 11 runner-up finishes. But he's not the only one turning heads at SHR. Kurt Busch, the 2004 champion, also has two wins to his name this season and is sitting comfortably in a chase grid, but knows the difficulties of the format all too well. Kurt Busch has his 26th Sprint Cup win. You can't have mistakes. I mean, there's three races at a time through the chase, and if you have one tough race, you have to go all in. You have to win, basically, the next week. And so it makes it tough. If um, you have nice, consistent runs, then you can work your way through it. Win number 29 at the checkered flag, Kevin Harvick for Stewart oh, Haas Racing. Six consecutive top two finishes. The three races this year and the three last year. Winning obviously makes it a lot easier to go through each round if you can be able to win the race and, and be able to uh, have a little bit of a breather and give the team guys a little bit of a breather uh, to kind of get out of that those intense moments that, that you have because it's 10 weeks of, of pretty intense stuff. I mean, it's always going to be hard to defend the championship, and I think in reality it's going to be harder uh, these coming years than what it's ever been in our sport. Just the way that chase format is now, and you got four guys that go to Homestead, and the, the guy that outruns the other three is the champion, and it's hard to, to do that. You know, if it was just putting 10 races together and having the most points at those 10 races, I think we've got a team that could do that. Maybe a similar way to look at it is uh, like World Cup soccer. You have the pooling group, that first group. You can have a loss. If you have a tie, it's tough, but you got to get those points to advance. NASCAR's playoffs kick off at the Chicagoland Speedway on the 20th of September, and for defending champ Harvick and his team, experience and momentum are key to getting through the chase. And this year has obviously been a good year. You know, we'd all like to have won more races, but I think when you look at the consistency and you look at the performance and the things that, that we've done, you know, I think that gives us a lot of confidence to, to know that when you go into those last 10 weeks, you know you can do what you need to do to win a championship. You just have to push the button at the right time. We learned a lot last year. I think we could go to Homestead and do a lot better job than what we did last year. So, you know, every day we learn more and more, and we've got a great race team, and we're definitely going to give it our 100%. With SHR looking for a third NASCAR title, Tony Stewart is ready to provide his team with whatever is needed. You want to make sure you've given them every tool they can to, to be successful. So it's a hard decision because you don't want to sacrifice from yourself, but at the same time, you're giving to yourself as well by helping out your teammates and uh, 
all four of us as drivers, as crews, we would all do that for each other if that scenario came around for, for each of us. So that's what a great team and a great organization is all about is you know being able to, to make changes and adjustments and uh, you know, having the ability to, to take care of each other. Next, it's time to get up to speed with a former F1 ace who's currently racing in the World Endurance Championship. Hey, I'm Alex Woods, I race for Toyota Gasu Racing. I'm going to get you up to speed. My proudest moment of my racing career was my first uh, Le Mans victory. I would really love to do the Indy 500, or I would have loved to do because now uh, time has passed. I'm maybe not prepared anymore to take the risk of the super speedways, but it's one of these races I, I wish I would have done. The last time I was really scared, not too far ago, when my wife dropped me at the airport. Uh, she was driving the car and, you know, that's a little bit scary. One place in the world I love to visit, sounds a bit strange, is actually my own home, because I'm not there enough. Uh, I really like it to be there, I'm in a luxurious position to travel around the world as it is. So home sometimes is just paradise. We have very good fans. Some of them take, uh, take it very serious, get offers to marry some girls. I said no, but it's kind of cool to get such an offer. <laughs> and now, you're up to speed. We're off to Germany now for round four of the World Endurance Championship. 60,000 people turned out as the WEC arrived at the Nürburgring for the first time. The Porsche team in confident mood after claiming a historic 17th Le Mans crown in the previous round. It's nice to get the consolidation from Le Mans. I think that uh, the double victory there was uh, was an amazing result. And uh, you know, for us to come here to the short tracks like someone like Nürburgring, Audi have really been uh, top of the pops on those type of circuits. So that's why it's a really big day for us. With Toyota struggling for performance and Nissan not competing, round four would be a battle of the German giants Porsche and Audi. The six-hour race began with LMP1, LMP2 and both GTE classes packed together for a rolling start. The two Porsche 919 slotting into an early lead. With Neil Yarny leading in the number 18, Timo Bernhard in the 17 was fighting hard to stay in front of the Audi after losing his front nose cone. Last year's champions Toyota didn't have the pace to compete for victory. Behind the number one TS40, Alex Burt would guide the sister car to a sixth place finish. The battle at the front was ultimately decided when a faulty fuel flow sensor on the 18 Porsche led to a series of stop-go penalties. In GTE Pro, the Mansai Porsches had no such trouble. As Michael Christensen led, Patrick Pile in the sister 911 put a superb move on David Brigon Ferrari to take second. Back in LMP1, Neil Yarny produced an incredible fight back and was looking to reclaim second in an epic scrap with Benoit Trenier's Audi. In the end, the Vysak team proved unstoppable. Richard Leitz led home a 1-2 finish in GTE Pro. In the LMP1 class, Mark Webber made it a clean sweep with overall victory. Sister car following behind in second. It was the Aussie's first win in the series, extending Porsche's lead in the manufacturer's standings. To end today's Mobile One The Grid, we sit down with Nissan's most celebrated protégé, Jan Mardenborough. Few careers have been as closely monitored as that of Jan Mardenborough's. He's the ultimate proof that taking video gamers onto the racetrack can yield results. Lots has happened since 2011 when I uh, won GT Academy from a gamer. Gone from GT4, GT3, LMP2, and then in between some single seaters with Formula 3 and GP3 as well. And uh, now being a factory driver for Nissan and LMP1 is uh, yeah, it's nice, I like it. The 23 year old Brit has progressed alongside Nissan's own ambitions in sports car racing from GTs to LMP2 and now their LMP1 program. But he also has ambitions in Formula racing. Single seat is going good. I'm in my second year of GP3 now, but uh, my ambition is to reach the top of the sport, which is Formula One. But also, that's not taking away the fact that I'm very satisfied with where I am at the moment. In GP3, he races for the successful Carlin outfit, and though it's very competitive, he hasn't given up his dreams of making motorsports top category. 
Well, GP3, it's um, it's a very good championship to be in. The last few winners of the championship have made it to Formula 1. With Danny Kvyat, Valtteri Bottas, and now uh, you know, Alex Lins, a reserve driver, or test driver for, for Williams. So for me to compete in that championship, it's nice to know that I'm in a championship where you can actually progress and reach the top of your sport, which gives me good confidence. And it gives me some confidence as well to put me in that championship in the first place, knowing that if I do well, it can lead to somewhere great. Jan even got his first taste of GP2 recently at the infamous high-speed Monza circuit. He's also a big part of Nissan's LMP1 team. Despite their stuttering World Endurance Championship campaign, the front-engine Nismo is a unique experience. The car to drive is very different to anything I've driven before, mainly because of the fact it's front-wheel drive. There is more mass towards the front of the car than there is the rear. So when you approach a slow-speed corner, um, you can't trouble brake as much as you would in a rear engine car because you will lift the inside wheel up in the air. You have to pick up the throttle a little bit earlier than we would normally and this in turn the rear movement is a lot greater in a slow speed corner but it's all okay because we have the front axle to pull us out of the corners. It just requires a different way of driving. Being a racing driver it's all about adapting and you have to adapt to different situations. Each lap is always different, every car you drive is different. The number 23 didn't finish at Le Mans and sat out the Nürburgring. But Nissan hoped to eventually challenge Porsche, Audi and Toyota. If not, then there's always F1. Well, if uh, Nissan start an F1 team, that would be absolutely fantastic. You know, hopefully I'll be the one driving that car, but being a factory driver, you know, supported by Nissan. Factory teams, it's huge, and also I think it, it works well as well with the single seaters and the GT racing, sports car racing. Whatever you learn in each category is completely transferable. They require different skills completely to drive these cars in these different championships. It helps overall to make me a better driver. I'm very thankful that Nissan are continuing to support me in both categories, single seaters and sports cars. I'm very satisfied with what I've achieved at the moment, but uh, I want to keep going as well. It's likely Nissan will stay concentrated on sports car racing for now, but Jan is happy doing a bit of everything. I love being busy, you know. Uh, racing is, is my job, and I'm just happy to be in the first place, but also to be a part of such a radical car and project. I think I look back in a few years' time and think, wow, that is very cool to be a part of. It's a master in my career, and also a master for Nissan as well. Next time, we talk to US star Danica Patrick and meet a family of Swiss racers. Meanwhile, join us on YouTube, Twitter and at mobile1thegrid.com to hear from Mark Webber, take a look inside the Stuart Haas race shop and watch more exclusive content from the home of motorsport videos on the web. See you next time.